Has anybody ever looked at you and said, you look just like your mom or your dad? Could it be, could it just be that all of life is sheer gift? And if so, could it be that all of the gifts in our lives are from the hand of a joyously generous giver? And that, could it be that you and I were actually created in the image of that giver? Imago Dei, made in the image of God. When it comes to joyful generosity, has anybody ever looked at you and said, you look just like your Father, your Heavenly Father? As we continue our sermon series on the seven habits of highly effective Christians, we come today to be encouraged to cultivate the habit of generous, joyful generosity. And that is something that uh, is crucial if you and I are going to be effective Christians. Indeed, this past week, we've seen evidence of that kind of spirit surface in the lives of countless people uh, who jumped in literally to rescue people and animals, and we've seen it surface right here in this congregation. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the way you all have generously responded to the need in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. You look just like your father, your heavenly father. Now, let's look as Paul reveals to us just how cultivating a habit of joyful generosity is really crucial, especially in times of crisis. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to take a look at verses 6 through 9 this morning, and let's pray before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word, that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it, and that we might faithfully apply it to our lives for Jesus' sake. Amen. And now, hear God's word as we begin to read at verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work, as it is written. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Let's pray again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The context of this passage we've just read is crisis. There's a crisis in the early church. Mother Church, the church of Jerusalem, has had some kind of financial meltdown. We don't know exactly what it is or how it happened. We're just told it's true. And the Apostle Paul has given an all-points bulletin appeal for the churches of the Mediterranean region to jump in and help rescue Mother Church in Jerusalem. Now, crises always bring out the best and the worst in people. This past week, we've watched as countless Texans and others have, have jumped in and rescued people and animals and, and done all kinds of wonderfully, even right, life-risking things. But we've also seen the worst. Insurance scammers coming on the scene. People trying to gouge hungry people by selling bread for $15 a loaf. Well, back in the first century, the Apostle Paul was absolutely shocked and surprised by what he saw happen. The church in Macedonia, the poorest of poor churches, somehow was able to piece together 
a rather substantial financial gift to help the church in Jerusalem. Paul was blindsided by their generosity. It was the kind of gift that he expected from a church like the affluent Corinthian church. But they were tight-fisted. And that's why in verse 6 of our text, Paul admonishes that Corinthian church. And he does so by using what you might call a farmer uh, proverb. If you sow sparingly, you're going to reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. Now, I was a pre-veterinary major in college. I was planning on being a large animal vet uh, for a few years while I was in college. I worked on a dairy farm out in Leon Valley, and we grew our own hay to feed over 800 head of Holstein cows. Now, any good dairyman would tell you that what Paul says in verse 6 is kind of a a, a duh agricultural principle. If you're going to produce a lot of milk, you got to feed a lot of cows, and that means you can't piddle around with your planting. Effective farmers are prolific planters. So why is it that the Corinthians, and maybe some of us here today, think it's any different when it comes to the kingdom of God? My friends, I believe it's impossible. It's impossible to be an effective Christian if you and I are not faithfully investing all of those generous, joyful gifts that God has poured into our lives, investing them, our our, our talents, our time, our resources, into whatever it is that God's calling us to do. The, The main point the Apostle Paul's trying to get across in this text is that an effective Christian is a man or woman, a boy or girl, who is all in for Christ and his kingdom. Now, I'm going to dare to go from preaching to meddling and say that I believe it's impossible to be an effective Christian without cultivating the habit of joyful generosity, particularly in terms of investing financially in God's worldwide kingdom enterprise. I just don't think... Don't tell me how committed to Christ you are. Show me your checkbook, and I'll tell you whether or not you look like your father. More than one time from this very pulpit, I heard a senior pastor who I admire greatly say, true joy is planting a tree under which you know you will never sit. My friends, I believe you and I start cultivating the habit of joyful generosity when we take on the biblical principle of the tithe. That's 10% of one's income, gross income, before taxes invested in God's worldwide kingdom enterprise. Not all necessarily coming to first press. If you came to Christ through young life, then you ought to give them a nice chunk of money to help that ministry every year. But the truth is that we'll never be effective Christians until we are practicing that biblical principle. And I believe the way to to, to start doing that is to sit down and just deal with reality. Sit down and say to yourself, wow, everything, 100% of everything I have is a gift joyously and generously poured into my life by my Heavenly Father. Step two is to say, thank you, Lord, and now I'm going to give it all, 100% back to you. And then step three is, then listen for his gracious voice. Because you know what he's going to say to you? He's going to say, thanks. Now I'm giving you back 90% of that to do whatever you want with it. All I'm asking is you invest 10% of that in my worldwide kingdom enterprise. You know, that's a pretty gospelly gracious good deal, my friends. Pretty good deal. Now, I know what some of you are thinking, because I've been there. Some of you are thinking, Ron, there's just no possible way I could ever afford to tithe. Well, give me your checkbook again. Give me a calculator, 
and I'll prove to you that you can not tithe. But then go ahead and do it. And then watch verse 8 start to play out in your life. Look what verse 8 says. Verse 8 says that God graciously will pour an abundance of grace into your life, giving you all sufficiency at all times, in all places, to be able to do what he wants to do in terms of good works in and through your lives to impact the lives, particularly of those folks and those situations that are in crisis or in need. In fact, Paul goes on in verse 9 to quote Psalm 112, verse 9, which answers that question about how was the Macedonian church that was dirt poor able to produce a financial gift for the Jerusalem church? It's because verse 8 is all about God's mysteriously weird economics. God's economics do not follow the Harvard Business School rules. It's, it's weird. Over th- in over 39 years of pastoral ministry, I have challenged many people over the years to take God up on a challenge to tithe. And many people have taken my challenge. Some reluctantly, or most reluctantly, many with fear. I have never, ever had even one person come back to me and say, well, that was a big mistake. Man, Ron, you've got me in all kinds of financial trouble. No, instead people come back to me saying things like, Ron, I, I, I don't know what's going on. This is weird. I, I feel like I have more money than I had before. And all these weird things are happening in my life, and I'm just nodding, yeah. Like one guy said, you know, my lawnmower gave up the ghost. I thought, oh, great, I'm going to have to replace a lawnmower. Knock at the door, a neighbor with a brand new Toro lawnmower who says, I'm moving to Alaska. I'm living on an ice floe or something. I'm not going to need this. I'm not even going to sell it to you. Just take it. Weird things like that start to happen. That's God's mysteriously weird economy at work. So what do Christians who cultivate habits of joyful generosity look like? Well, they look like you, First Presbyterian Church, who have jumped in and answered the call of relief in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. They look like you, First Presbyterian Church, who years ago, after I left here for my first tour of duty, um, you saved San Fernando Cathedral. Did you know you did that? When I came back, my dear friend David Garcia, who uh, in the 90s was the rector of San Fernando Cathedral, he called me, we went out to lunch. He said, Ron, while you were away, did you know that your church saved San Fernando Cathedral? I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well... The engineers did a study of the building. It was built like in 1715 or whatever. And they said, the thing's ready to cave in. And then presented David with the bill to fix it. And it was millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars. And he said, Ron, we're a poor parish. We don't have any money. Even if we did, we're Roman Catholics. We don't know how to raise money. We don't know how to do those capital campaigns. So David calls that pastor who talks about you know true joy being planting a tree that you're never going to sit under and he recruits a team out of this congregation uh, to be the capital campaign team for San Fernando Cathedral one of our members chaired it came back with a five million dollar lead gift from his company and as we get ready to celebrate the 300th anniversary of San Antonio the crown jewel ecclesiastically sits soundly in the middle of the city. Joyously generous Christians look like you, First Pres, who shot us almost $100,000 over our budget last year. Hope you do it again this year. Um, They look like the owner of an affiliate of a national moving van company who lives here in San Antonio, who moved in in our family from Dallas to San Antonio almost three years ago. He called this week said, I'm placing at First Presbyterian's disposal as many 18-wheelers with my drivers as you need to take supplies, materials to the Gulf Coast when you're ready to do it. Finally, they look like three young, all-in-for-Christ 
businessmen who began, they didn't know each other, they began their business careers about the same time, but all three just said from the get-go, I'm going to tithe to the kingdom of God. And they did so, and as they became more successful in business, all three of them decided to up their generosity to 20% of their income. And then as God's mysteriously weird economy began to greatly impact their businesses, they upped their generosity to 50% of their income. Now, I am not saying any of you should do that. I'm just saying this is how three guys began to play this out. In fact, by the time they were at the end of their careers, get this, all three men, they'd become prominent, some of the most prominent American businessmen at the time invested 100% of their income in God's worldwide kingdom enterprise. I want you to think about that this Labor Day weekend when you put Mr. Hines' ketchup on your burger, when you pour Mr. Kraft's dressing on your salad, and then at the end of the day when you brush your teeth with Mr. Colgate's toothpaste. The point is this, my friends, you and I cannot outgive God. Try it. Houston, the coastal bend, indeed the entire world is depending on it. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.